This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Check out the extended version of this video when you sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula using the link in the description. In my last video on the three tech ethics books you should read in 2021, one of you pointed out that none of those books really touched on the impact that AI systems have on the LGBTQ plus community. And well, first, you were right. But second, that question made me think about why I don't tend to see a lot of research on algorithmic fairness and ethics as it relates to the queer community, especially compared to things like racial and gender bias. Even if you look in popular media, there's been the occasional media swarm around AI gaydar, as well as the recurring joke that the TikTok algorithm has helped many people figure out that they were not straight during quarantine. Which, granted, if I didn't already know that I was bi, the TikTok algorithm definitely would have revealed that to me too. But the fact that most of you probably didn't know that is actually an example of why algorithmic fairness research when it comes to the queer community can be kind of challenging. I mean, personally, I can walk around outside and be worried about how people are going to treat me because of the color of my skin or my gender presentation, but my sexuality isn't actually something that I'm usually particularly worried about because it's not obvious on site. In other words, it's an unobserved feature, something that we can't easily or accurately derive from the average dataset. I first found the term unobserved feature or unobserved characteristic in this DeepMind paper, which focuses on the impact of emerging technologies on queer communities, and it highlighted a challenge that hadn't really occurred to me when it came to algorithmic fairness and developing fairer systems. Namely, that when we think about designing fair algorithms, we tend to think about designing fairness around observable characteristics and features. Things like race and either self-identification of gender identity or your perceptions of other people's gender identities. In short, we focus on things that are either explicitly in our datasets or things that can be fairly easily extracted from our datasets. However, fairness becomes challenging when you start looking at unobserved features such as sexual orientation or gender identity. In other words, things that we can't necessarily know about someone by just looking at the data. And considering the long history of violence and oppression against the queer community that continues into today, the risks associated with developing and using biased AI systems are pretty significant. Starting with probably the most obvious one, sexuality and gender identity tend to be things that people like to keep fairly private. And this is only heightened for people within the queer community because outing someone may cause not only just personal distress, but also physical and social abuse. Anything from being disowned by your family, to losing your job, to online harassment campaigns, to being jailed or even killed. And yes, that last one does happen fairly often to trans people in the United States. Now, privacy-preserving machine learning techniques that we've talked about on my channel, you can check out videos for that up here, do actually have the potential to allow people to maintain privacy over their identities, while still letting them benefit from the AI system as a whole, which could be exciting. However, there's also been a lot of interest in developing algorithms that can predict someone's gender identity or sexual orientation based on various data associated with them. One particularly well-known example of this is a 2017 Stanford paper, which reported high accuracies in identifying self-reported sexual orientation and sought off a media frenzy around AI gaydar. Now, there are a lot of limitations to this paper, some of which the authors actually acknowledge both in the paper and in a follow-up document that they released to the public addressing a lot of the criticisms for it. And some of the media reporting on this article did actually take the work out of context, but I'm not gonna dive too deep into either of those here. You can check out the Nebula Plus version of this video for that. But the fact that their research has some holes doesn't mean that future attempts wouldn't be much more successful, especially if you start looking at data sets of people's digital fingerprints and behaviors, say like the TikTok algorithm. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum is the risk of censorship, which is often done under the guise of maintaining decency and protecting the children. And this is actually already done in several states in the United States, as well as in several countries around the world. For example, the US states shown here in blue have laws that prohibit health educators from teaching students about LGBTQ plus people or topics, with some requiring that teachers portray them in a negative way. And when it comes to algorithms, there have been many similar examples of creators accusing platforms, including YouTube, of censoring and demonetizing queer content. And while YouTube has denied those claims, as have most US platforms that have faced similar accusations, A, it doesn't mean that other systems couldn't be developed to do the same thing, and B, especially when we start looking at things like deep learning, doesn't mean that the potential for that bias to be hidden in these large models that can be hard to tease out isn't there. In fact, it is already. We've seen this in things like GPT-3. On the potential upside, however, researchers have used machine learning and statistical analysis to actually uncover censored words words that are being censored by platforms in Turkey and China, so we may have the ability to use machine learning
learning to actually give people the resources to get their content out there, avoiding censorship. Now, the last area I want to talk about is health because health, interestingly enough, is a particularly thorny area when it comes to algorithmic fairness. Health datasets are generally anonymized. In the US, we have HIPAA regulations. In the UK, there's things like GDPR. And often the information removed from our healthcare records includes things like gender, sexuality, HIV status, and whether or not the person has a history of substance abuse. And this information is removed in order to prevent people from being re-identified based on their data and facing many of the consequences that we've talked about earlier in this video. So on one hand, these protections can often help the queer community to maintain privacy and avoid stigma. But on the other hand, when it comes to developing algorithms that are designed to target healthcare for queer communities, we don't necessarily have the data that we need to do that accurately. In particular, since most of our healthcare data comes from cisgendered people, predictive algorithms designed for trans people who are currently transitioning might be anywhere from ineffective to actively harmful. Now, interestingly, there's very little research on whether or not this is an issue, so I don't want to make people concerned about how algorithms are being used on the queer community when it comes to health, but I also have no evidence that there isn't a problem. There have been efforts to develop algorithms that can predict sexual orientation based on medical notes, although this also comes with the caveat that you may end up outing someone to their healthcare provider when they have not actually explicitly agreed to that. Having said all that, AI systems could certainly help the queer community in a lot of ways when it relates to healthcare, especially as it relates to mental health. Queer communities typically see higher prevalence of depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation, so developing systems that can identify high-risk people could save a lot of lives and help improve a lot of people's quality of life. In fact, the Trevor Project has actually partnered with Google to develop AI systems that train their crisis counselors and identify higher risk colors so that they can get the help that they need while providing more outreach to new people who have called in for help. Now, while all the considerations and challenges and repercussions that I've talked about so far are targeted towards the queer community, I do want to highlight that addressing these challenges and concerns has the potential to help out everyone outside of that community as well. Whether it be someone who has a loved one who might be affected by these issues, or whether someone's actually misidentified as being part of the queer community and faces these repercussions. I'll also note that the challenge of unobserved features isn't limited to the queer community. Other unobserved characteristics include things like religious identity, class, and disability status. So designing algorithms that take all of these into account and that are fairer to all of these identities is better for pretty much everyone. And this is actually something that I explore more in the Nebula Plus version of this video. If you're new to my channel, Nebula is a creator-built platform where you get to watch my videos ad-free and some of your favorite creators, including myself, can create and experiment with awesome content without having to worry about demonetization or paying tribute to the YouTube algorithm. We're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction videos. Want to learn more about how datasets impact our lives? Check out The Joy of Data, where mathematician Hannah Fly explores how data is stored, shared, made sense of, and what it reveals about us and the world. And where CuriosityStream is all about big budget nonfiction documentaries, we're building Nebula so that education creators have a place to try out content that might not work as well on YouTube. On Nebula, you'll find ad-free videos from some of your favorite creators, from Marquez Brownlee to The Coding Train to Tearzoo, as well as my Nebula Plus content, which includes extended versions of the videos you see on my channel. You'll also find Nebula Originals, like Tom Scott's Game Show Money, or a very good trivia show where I won $500 for drawing a very nice circle. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so if you click on the link in the description or use my promo code JORDAN, you can access CuriosityStream for 26% off their annual plans, with Nebula included for free for as long as you are a CuriosityStream member. That's less than $15 a year. Signing up for CuriosityStream is a great way to directly support my channel while getting to watch my videos ad-free, so sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula at CuriosityStream.com JORDAN or using the promo code JORDAN. Otherwise, if you like this video, let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also check me out on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, my newsletter, probably other places I spend too much time on the internet these days. Otherwise, I'll see y'all on Monday. Bye!